All right, so let me kick off. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, we have with us today two people I want to um, at least introduce and share just a bit about this project and the kickoff for today and kind of the history. Uh, so first welcoming uh, Kara uh, Price, who has been very instrumental in creating the Your Voices initiative or project, which this webinar is the first part of. So the Your Voices, I'll just give a brief um, little tidbit about it. And Kara, if you can put in the chat the link to our blog. So Your Voices Learning, Listening, Sharing is a initiative that uh, is for academic year 2022-2023, so this fall and spring, um, with the emphasis of focusing on student voices. So for all of you that are students, we want to hear from you. Um, we are including four EDI-focused webinars. We also will be setting up um, community learning spaces um, in which you can join sessions just for students to um, discuss whatever you'd like in those sessions. And then we will be creating uh, four quarterly e-newsletters. Um, so the link is in the chat. You can look at that further at your leisure. But this webinar is the first of our uh, kickoff of the Your Voices project. And so I'm gonna introduce Dr. Leslie Farmer. Uh, she is with Cal State University Long Beach, so one of our sister schools. And so she's gonna speak with us today about visual literacy in terms of cultural connotations. I'll turn it over to you, Leslie. Thank you so much. It's uh, such an honor to be able to uh, be part of this project in terms of presenting. Um, so I'm glad that you folks are here. Know that if you have you know, questions, you can put them in chat. I uh, will probably be asking about your voices um, as well while we're um, kind of sharing this information. So specifically, I'm going to be talking about visual literacy in terms of cultural connotations. And just a little bit about myself, I uh, coordinate the Teacher Librarian Services Credential Program at California State University, Long Beach. I also manage the Information and Communications Technology uh, Literacy Community within Merlot, which is an international repository database of learning materials. And I've been interested in visual literacy for a really long time. My minor is art. My husband was in uh, art um, uh, marketing. And, uh, you know, I, I continue to really push on this, particularly now uh, with so much you know, international access to information that is visual. You know, the internet used to be mainly textual, and so we're kind of broadening that. Uh, particularly with social media, we're seeing a lot more visuals. So there are some real consequences of that. So what I want to do today is just uh, share with you then um, what are some of the visual literacy components and how they manifest themselves in different cultures so that you'll be more comfortable in uh, cross-cultural competencies. And also I'll be talking about the library's role in, in these endeavors as well. So again, we're gonna be talking about a little bit of cultural issues, talking about visual literacy, explaining the library's role, and then I'll be you know, sharing with you some uh, resources and strategies. So um, let's face it, we're talking about culture. Uh, we're talking about you know, group beliefs, social norms, and traits. So things that we have in common that are um, ongoing cultures, can be of all sorts. We tend to think in terms of like ethnicities or nationalities, but you know, uh, let's face it, librarians have their own culture. Within that, and even school librarians have their own culture, let alone, you know, Boy Scouts or Goths, etc. So, you know, a, a lot of these norms are, um, you know, at the subconscious level, uh, just because you know these are things that we've just practiced so much that they are you know integrated, and again, how we respond you know to culture, you know, it depends a lot on our context. It depends on our own backgrounds. You know what we bring to the table, both cognitively and emotionally. 
And what happens sometimes is particularly in cultural arts, so you know, images, visuals, is that it gets to be, it can be really uh, shallow. So we're going to do a little drilling today in our brief time together, okay? So again, um, I'm talking about cultural arts that is, sort of again where it really where the culture is central in that piece uh but we're also going to be talking more generally but in cultural arts in particular uh we're looking at what are sort of like visual patterns that you would see within you know a particular you know culture so you might think of like indian saris um you know, you might see that even in the uh, in the appearance of food, quite frankly. Um, but each of those that express kind of their own norms, their cultures, what's important to them. It could be, you know, by a single artist, it could be a group. You know, the idea, just like, you know, folklore, you know, has kind of like a whole group thing. So that can be the, the case as well with cultural arts. You'll see that particularly, you know, with those materials that are kind of like, before they've been, um, you know, historically written down. So again, you know, uh, you would see this maybe in patterns of woven baskets would be an example. And the contemporary artists can maybe do it as a group. They may, you know, be pulling on their own cultures. They may be adding, you know, to that because we know that cultures are dynamic. But you know, all these cultural arts, all these cultural visual images then are ways to communicate within and across different cultures. So we kind of have that as a, as a mainstay in there. So now then let's look at visual literacy and these elements are from the International Visual Literacy Association. They still hold. And that is that you're able to take a visual image, you know, be able to access it, uh, understand it, appreciate it, that you yourself can generate visual images and be able to communicate you know, effectively. And that also includes using technology these days. And also to be able to take uh, visual thinking as a way to solve problems. So, you know, um, you know, whether you have like a concept map or, you know, you're kind of drawing a model you know, all of those kinds of things are ways then to approach knowledge and representation of that knowledge. So visual elements themselves and the principles of, of visuals and visual literacy are international. Uh, basically, we're just codifying what people have experienced and generated, you know, throughout history. So it's sort of the, you know, the obvious things that that we deal with, you know, dots and lines and value and the size of things. And motion is also part of the, of the visual scope. And then in terms of actually creating an image, a composition, so to speak, there are, again, these universal principles, again, codified just by, you know, observation over time across cultures, you know, the idea of balance, of contrast, whether it's in line or color, you know, the idea of, of different patterns repeating in sometimes in a, a rhythmic way and the idea of both unity and variety. And a lot of this is, you know, are, are elements that you might not even know on a conscious level or name them, but they are, you know, part of our, you know, human way of, of uh, visually representing ideas. So then the additives, you know, the cultural visual additives then is like your cho the choice of your medium. And again, that usually starts talking about you know, historically, what are the materials that are available that are around you? You know, if there are reeds around you, you're going to use that. If you've got clay kind of soil, you're going to use that, right? So, um, you know, that's going to be part of you know, your endemic, you know, culture, your subject. And again, what's around you, that's going to be the first kind of um, choice. Um, and then we get a little more, you know, sophisticated in terms of like how we use, you know, space and perspective. And um, for example, in, in this image, you know, right here, you can appreciate it without knowing any of the culture, but Again, here we're talking about iconic versus realistic. This is more, you know, iconic 
um, you know, in terms of kind of a, you know, Hindu, you know, religion, and its use, again, is in terms of, um, you know, representing, you know, gods, and, you know, our behavior that is impacted, you know, by gods and by, you know, engaging in this, and perspective here. Um, so the higher something is in you know these kinds of artwork that means the farther away it is and it could be exactly the same size but the higher it is then the farther away it is and the lower down it is then the closer it is and also here you're talking about earth and then you know heaven so here you know the the elevation you know where it is in the composition uh, shows both distance as well as particular, you know, values. So the more that you know about the culture and the more that you know how those visual principles are manifested in a particular culture, then the richer your experience is going to be. And also the less um, misunderstanding you're going to have in terms of engaging with those visuals. So again, when we're talking about visual processing, we're talking about parts that are universal. So dots and lines, you know, that kind of a thing, how our brain is, you know, uh, going to process that is, is pretty universal. Uh, there might be some uh, shadings on that. For instance, if you're colorblind, there's going to be, you know, slight differences. But the mental process, right? So the connotations, the context on that is going to be subjective. Now here, this is kind of a, simplistic um you know example but let's face it you know some people would see this as a base and some people would see this as two faces you know interacting again the process is the same but how then we interpret that image is subjective and in some cases culture enters you know into that process so uh, one of the pieces that's really important when we're discussing about, you know, visual literacy is uh, semiotics. And the definition there is kind of both the science as well as the arts, the craft of interpreting culture. It's, you know, knowledge manifestations by its expressions, behaviors, and artifacts. And meaning that, you know, the same image may have a different interpretation depending on the culture. So we're going to start with this image right here. Uh, not my face, but you know, this image. So when you're looking at it, what what meaning do you take out of it? What, you know, as you're as you're looking at this image, what do you see? What what do you think it represents? So you can just put that in the chat. Okay, so a choir, a gospel choir, all right. So what makes you think that it's a gospel choir? What parts of that image make you think that? Okay, so stained glass, all right. So probably could be a church, does it? Right? Blue and white robes. So you could be a choir and have blue and white robes and not be gospel. So you're guessing that there's there's singing. So what images? So the robes kind of in there. See, so you see church. Okay. So when you see motifs, so are you talking about kind of the designs in the borders? Okay. So community, because here's a group of people. Okay. So realize that you had to have experience of church or seeing, you know, stained glass in a window that you had to experience or see, you know, in a prior part, um, you know, robes, you're seeing, you know, the color of faces, it looks like they're people, right? You have had, okay, so then um, arms raised as in doing a choir. So again, you're bringing your background, you know, to this. If you had never, you know, seen insides of a church, if you hadn't experienced some of those motifs that you're seeing in the background on and on the sides, you might not, you could appreciate this. It's got, you know, balance. It's got good contrast. So, you know, the principles, you know, are all there. So kind of pleasant, 
bright kind of colors, so some connotations there. Um, but the more that you understand culturally, you know, some of this, then you have a greater appreciation, you know, of that image. All right. So then let's take a look at so these col uh, cultural connotations of, of visuals, because that's where, you know, you can sometimes get into trouble. <laughs> So, um, owls, so depending on the culture, uh, if for you know owls, and I have a couple of little you know stuffed owls in my office, you know, so we kind of think of owls as wisdom in, you know, uh, a lot of U.S. culture, but in other in other cultures, it means they're stupid or it's brutal, right? Uh, rabbits, so you know, you think of little bunny rabbits, maybe you're thinking of you know, some cartoon type rabbit. So we've got the idea of reproduction, but also it could go into like promiscuity. It could also be food, right? And in some places it's kind of like they're pests. Uh, thumbs uh, up, you know, the circle thumb in some cultures, that's an obscene sign. And then um, even things about, you know, um, you know, two intersecting lines can be mathematical. It could also be a value showing like get away or something that's evil. So again, we need to know, you know, when we're like, for instance, we are creating web pages, you know, we need to be cognizant of that or when we're seeing you know, other web pages as well. One that I have a problem with as a librarian is a book room because, you know, they basically are eating books that destroy property. So, uh, you know, there's got to be some better <laughs> images that go along with that uh, in my, oh, that's my own experience. It's kind of uh, giving a little bias there. Um, okay, yes, so good. Well, I'm glad that you spotted that. Someone noticed about this. This is a, not an owl, this is a cat. And yes, this is a fat cat. And so get you know, the idea of money that's, so she was able to read that, good. You know, the cigar, again, this is very, you know, uh, U.S. oriented because if nothing else, the dollar sign. Um, and usually when we think of fat cats, so that's usually a negative connotation uh, that certainly makes a difference from just a, you know, kitty cat or hello kitty, right? So, um, you know, there are, you know, nuanced ones of within each of these uh, figures. So like Bugs Bunny is a lot different maybe than the Easter Bunny, right? So thank you for catching that. All right, color is a huge thing in terms of cultures and, and connotations. Um, so again, you know, white has a different, you know, meaning in European cultures uh, as opposed to, you know, Eastern um, Asian ones. Um, so same thing with, you know, red, I'm sure, you know, danger in European and Japanese cultures and China's joint festivities, Vietnamese wedding dresses are often red. Um, you would be fairly um, rash, I think, uh, to, or, or very confident to wear a red wedding dress in, in the United States, you know, for example. And then Game of Thrones has this whole connotation with red in their wedding, right? Um, and then yellow, for example, cowardice in Western cultures in China was you know, restricted just to the emperor, and it's used as a color of mourning in Mexico. That's, so this is just the tip of the iceberg. And I have on the bottom some uh, URL to a really good site that goes you know, by different cultures and what those different colors mean. So again, uh, you know, just as an example, even so, like the color blue, you, know, you can get more nuanced. Um, for example, there is a color blue that the United States um, dentists often use, and it's just, just show you know very professional looking. But in Britain, that hue of blue is kind of you know considered not very professional at all. And they use a different color blue to show that you're really classy and professional. So just little things like that. Uh, a really interesting activity to do is to look at websites from different cultures, different you know countries, and you're gonna see different color themes. Some of them, uh, tend to be, you know, uh, have really bright colors. Uh, some of them tend to have really um, dark ones. Uh, the images, uh, 
is an, another example in terms of uh, representation. So um, I've seen a number of um, images of websites from um, Islamic, you know, uh, uh, cultures where the women are never shown like a as an individual, but they might be as a group, or that there won't be very many women that are pictured, but rather it's men that are pictured both individually as in a group. So that's another thing that you can look at is to see what uh, kinds of images you know are used. So again, um, when we're looking at visuals, we really should be thinking about you know the the cultural context of it. So are are those images then basically supporting, reinforcing, promoting a particular you know culture? How do those image images reflect certain beliefs and norms? You know what what is their you know, worldview, you know, um, what kinds of stereotypes and stereotypes isn't necessarily bad. We're really talking about, again, codification of trends that are sometimes, you know, uh, fairly representative. They certainly don't get at everybody. Um, and I think that's where we kind of like overgeneralize. That's sort of what stereotypes do. And again, they're based on perceptions, which may be accurate or really inaccurate. Um, you know, reading, you know, the the role view in terms of you know who's in control, hierarchy of values, et cetera. So when we're looking at um, this image, you know here, uh, what kinds of of um, you know values do you think are proponing? Do you see this as a uh, image that tends to be? I mean, do you read this as a positive image? As a um, You know, um, is it promoting, you know, something? Is it, you know, respectful? Um, what do you see as their worldview? So if you put that in the chat or think about it individually. Okay, so positive from a Mexican perspective. Good, good. So yeah, so they're, right, respect and love for family. Okay, and what about that, do you know, Day of the Dead, okay, which is a celebratory holiday, right? And so again, you know, um, folks that have put on the, you know, their ideas in the chat, you know, are aware of those cultural things, right? So joy, and how, do, how why does this seem to be joyful for you? What about the image seems joyful? What elements? Right, honoring. Okay, good. So smiles. Now, some people might think that that's like a ah. So you're interpreting that the the showing of the teeth as as a smile. All right. Um. Good. So the colorful, right? The color, the you know, the use of color. Absolutely. All right. And I think it's real interesting to see that that they tend to be like you know pink there might be some you know feelings of uh being more feminine so again you know different colors have different gendered connotations as well and i'm seeing that you folks are also being able to make those personal connections you know if it's your family or friends or again experiences you may have seen the movie coco you know so that again informs you in terms of looking you know at at these images and even the fact that you've got roses in there so usually roses have a, a positive um you know perspective it'd be interesting to know if in some other cultures roses have a, a, a negative you know perspective as well or that they're not as as valued united states in mexico roses are quite highly valued right so that kind of gives you some ideas in terms of of how we then need to think about you know visual literacy not only because of kind of those components but also because of the cultural contexts so again um as librarians uh what is our role in terms of visual literacy and 
Uh, UNESCO really pushes on libraries and cultural arts, as does IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. And um, IFLA would agree with this in that, you know, uh, UNESCO says, quote, we may adopt the existing cultural heritage, cultivate it and create something new out of it. Then we share our artifacts with others and contribute our artifacts to the pool of cultural heritage. So they're very much into the idea of cultural heritage, where we come from using those elements as then part of our continued you know, uh, lives and onwards to make new traditions, to sustain our, our heritage, to share it with others so that we have a better appreciation of what makes us unique and what makes us you know, uh, all part of humanity. So again, when we are looking at these images and then as you work, you know, with your, you know, clientele, your students, then here are some questions that are, are really basic for not only visual literacy, but also media literacy in general, media literacy basically saying, how does the format impact um, the message? in terms of its creation, its, the, its message, and how it's disseminated, what's the agenda. So with that, you know, here are just, you know, very straightforward questions to think about. It's like, so who created the message, right? So from that culture, I have to understand also that um, the images that I've shown you have been created by folks that were of that particular, you know, culture, but it could be that you know people will create images about a, a, a culture of which they are not a part of. So, for example, my slides backgrounds, you know, I have sort of a an East Asian feel to them, and I'm not of that culture, but I'm using that to represent concept of culture. So we do need to think about, you know, on who's creating the image. You know, is it a person of that culture? Is another? Is it a person of another culture? And their understanding of that culture, or how they might be, you know, um, their attitude towards that culture. So again, what tech? Techniques then are used to track your attention. So again, they're using those visual images we saw in both of the examples that I've given, you know, bright colors, um, you know, lots of information, kind of interesting uh, compositions, um, all of those then, you know, things that you could relate to. So those are some of the techniques that they used. And quite frankly, both of them are kind of, uh, they, use the compositions of a balance of symmetry, a variety of unity, all of those principles. So how might different people experience that message differently from you? So it's good for you to self-reflect about how that impacts you, but also think about, you know, how might someone else, you know, um, from a different culture, um, you know, a different set of values, you know, perceive this or that they might not understand or they could be confused by an image. So again, you know, what values, what points of view are represented or omitted, are not shown, right? That, you know, the, the uh, ideas between the lines, so to speak. And then what was the purpose, you know, of that image? Or was it to influence someone? Was it to celebrate? Was it to be, you know, um, derogatory about a particular value or, or group, a belief, you know, a concept? So, um, these are then are questions that you can ask your own, you know, uh, library users as well to help them to be more conscious, aware and conscious then of images and their uh, cultural connotations. And again, uh, just focusing specifically on culture, you know, um, think about what kinds of cultural patterns cross formats? So you saw kind of a photograph, you know, from Day of the Dead. So are those same things you see those, that, that same stuff in videos? We can see those in 3D objects. Um, we'll see those on websites. We'll see those in books. We'll see those in magazines and newspapers. And yet, you know, the those main figures, especially, you know, of the skull, the use of the color, do cross those different mediums within that culture, all right? 
Um, different cultures may well be known for different kinds of cultural uh, visual skills. Uh, I'm pushing this not only to, you know, uh, visual, but also like, you know, singing performance as well. Um, but again, um, I'm originally from Spokane, Washington, and the uh, indigenous folks of that area were known for, you know, their, their basketry, for example. And um, when you think of the Hopis, you think oftentimes of, you know, ceramics. Again, you know, so uh, in Ghana, there's, you know, wonderful weaving. So, you know, what skill, you know, so um, different cultures are kind of known for being really expert in certain things. You think of Belgian lace is, is another, you know, example. And then, um, you know, how... How then do they, those folks express their, their values you know, visually? And then, you know, again, how those cultural arts uh, reflect also events that happen. So again, here was the Day of the Dead. We saw the image of the choir. So they are, social event is a religious you know, um, event, for example. And then, you know, what cultural messages are conveyed in those arts? So those are questions that, you know, um, can kind of like look at a body of different types of, of artistic expressions, visual expressions, and then what that says about that culture. Now, some cultures are more, you know, homogeneous, you know, than others. Some are very diffuse. Uh, if you're to say like, um, you know, people who live in the United States, there's kind of a United States culture. That's really, you know, can be very diverse, right? And so, you know, it's very porous. And part of that is because, you know, the, our country, you know, U.S. country comes, you know, it involves a lot of different people of different kinds of cultures. And so, you know, your, your visuals can be really widely, widely different. And the norms could be very diverse where, you know, you think of, of Iceland and it's pretty much the same kind of ethnic group and you're going to, you know, uh, even current day, you know, um, uh, visuals will have, you know, uh, weavings will have sort of a uh, continuing um, look, you know, to them and some of the, you know, visual icon country is, you know, traditional that has kept up to, you know, the current, you know, uh, life. Again, getting a little bit beyond visuals, um, even their their music, even their pop music will uh, oftentimes build on some of the traditional um, tonalities. So again, you know, particular image, number one, and how that plays out. And then, you know, the visual arts in general in terms of different cultures. So um, how do we then uh, think not only about interpreting existing visual messages, but also in their production? Kind of hinted at that at the last slide. How, how do different cultures then approach, you know, visual arts? Uh, but also, you know, how then we can support that idea of uh, production and different strategies. How can we as librarians then kind of be into, you know, that picture. So um, starting out uh, by kind of like curating visual collections of different cultures. And you can do it, you know, a couple of ways, both in terms of a particular, you know, culture, uh, but also it could be, you know, uh, concepts or even things, you know, thematically and how different cultures then express you know, uh, what horses are, you know, how they're depicted in different cultures, for example, really simple one. Um, to have, you know, your own users ex explore their own cultural, you know, arts. Um, and then also for them then to take those elements that they may have researched and then they could then use those motifs, those different kinds of, you know, uh, ways of looking at perspective, for example, and to then generate art that um, is very culturally uh, rich, 
right? Very culturally specific, for example. And then you could also do a, a, a cultural mashup art that is different kinds of cultures and a really good example, you know, of that, that uh, makes a lot of money, quite frankly, is fashion. So we know that, you know, um, fashion designers, you know, do uh, reference different cultures and then that's how they will, you know, reinterpret them to, to fashion. So um, again, whether it's a kind of the, the a sari uh, look or, you know, different kinds of accessories and different and uses of, of different combinations of colors, um, boleros would be, you know, an example. Hats will oftentimes refer, uh, basically have references or connotations from, from different cultures. So that can be an interesting um, uh, thing. And again, plays very well in the United States uh, where, where uh, you could also look and see what kinds of cultural mashup are, exists and then how, you know, your own users then could also look at combinations of different cultures. And here we have um, <clears throat> kind of the whole uh, Star Wars, you know, cultures and Comic-Con. I mean, that's a whole, you know, culture in itself and how they are creating, you know, costumes, right? That are reflective of their own kind of pop culture. So it does, cultures don't necessarily have to have been started, you know, prehistory, you know, new cultures are also developing and emerging. So I want to just share with you some um, resources that could be useful for you. Uh, so UNESCO has a, salt, a site called Memory of the World, and this was um, started in 2000, you know, um, this is images from 2013, but it, it continues. This is when they were kind of like starting it. So there, you'll see they have, you know, uh, cultural, you know, sites, but these are also different artifacts from from different cultures, and they are well um, uh, tagged with a, you know, subject headings, etc. Again, from all around the world. Uh, this is the International Children's Digital uh, Library, and this is run um, out of the University of Maryland. And this has, um, it's, I'd say it's strongest in terms of picture books, again, from a, around the world, from, from different countries. And they're pretty good about having a lot of um, uh, traditional stories, uh, oftentimes because you, everybody, you know, people can look at these and access them that they tend to look at public domain works. And a lot of those are traditional stories. So you can really get some good, you know, cultural references, you know, on there. Thank you, um, Dr. Villagram for uh, putting these URLs on uh, in the chat. I appreciate that. So, and they're also in different languages as well. So again, visually you can, you know, look at these to see you know, what kinds of patterns you're seeing in a number of different books from the same culture, or they have one um, collections like um, Mother Goose ones. So you can see how Mother Goose stories might look different when they are told from different countries. Um, ISL, the International Association of School Librarians is a uh, unique um, organization. Um, and it does have folks from around the world and to kind of help their own students, again, these are school librarians, uh, to, to look at different cultures, to appreciate different cultures, to cross cultures. They have a project called Gigalit. And, um, you know, they're stating, this was one example, again, um, from earlier, one of their first years of doing this, I say that each culture has their own kind of proverbs and traditions. So children then get to share that. Uh, there's also an international um, bookmark project. So children create bookmarks and then share them you know, uh, across different cultures, you know, drawings from, you know, different, you know, cultures. And again, uh, a way to look at, you know, how different kids are depicting, you know, their family life, for example, as well as, you know, sharing those different ideas and just looking at them from a visual literacy perspective. 
Uh, so the Smithsonian has some uh, great um, sites, especially under their you know, education piece in terms of visuals and looking at different cultures. Uh, so you're going to see some great lessons some great culture, uh, some great collection, uh, you know, educational you know pieces on that great artifacts um and again because the smithsonian has like you know, um, museum of of um, african americans of native americans and they're going to be having one for um the latinx experience so again as well as you know historical uh things from um other parts of the world so this is a really rich you know site uh, this is from MIT, the Massachusetts um, Institute of Technology. And um, so they have a, a project that's been going on now for you know, a generation called Vis Visualizing Cultures. So again, um, they, will, they have a whole curriculum that's involved you know, with that. They talk about how um, you know, in, in exploration and colonization, how that has impacted folks and how that is represented you know, by different cultures, both those that are kind of the colonizers or oppressors and those folks who, you know, have been colonized by others. So you can get some really interesting um, interactions that way, looking at the same event from, you know, the different sides of, of folks that are involved, you know, in those uh, particular activities. Um, ECAI, uh, ECAI, Electronics Cultural Atlas Initiative is really fun. You can uh, look at, you know, different um, artifacts based on, you know, the culture or the part of the world. You can also, there's, uh, so you're going to see by, you know, atlases, you can do it by time, etc. So there's lots of different ways that you can parse out this database. Uh, Global uh, Memory Net is another uh, really good site for, you know, looking at different collections of artifacts. Um, and you can see there, so it's almost like a collection of, of, of collections. So you're seeing that, um, you know, you've got ones from like, uh, of, of, of all natures. So sometimes they're uh, specific, for instance, like human opium war. Right? And then you'll have like museums, or sometimes it's basically by you know the country. You've got like Chinese 56 ethnic groups. You know, you've got you know antique maps. So it, it crosses a lot of different ways. You could see you could do it by collections, by countries, by timelines. Um, so you can have great great fun with that. Um, this is from Taiwan and fa fairly recent. And what they were trying to do was to digitize their historical artifacts. Um, you can get a little bit of translations. So you can use Google Translate, but this is basically for their own you know, country, but it is a photo museum. So even if you can't read this stuff, you can at least get some idea of the visuals. What did they choose to show? What do, what patterns do you see? What values are you seeing in there? Because this is a really good example of, of how a, a, you know, a country then decides what's important to share within their community and make you know public to folks. So that's that's another way then to to drill down into you know visual literacy. Uh, the Library of Congress has a number of uh, different uh, collections that they've digitized. So the Library of Congress collects not only books and you know print kinds of things, but they also collect you know uh, videos, baseball cards, realia, et cetera. So um, again, you know, they are capturing, you know, experience of folks that are, you know, within, you know, this geographic, you know, space. And you can see that you can um, uh, browse them by topic. You can also, you know, browse it by, you know, a timeline, by, to um, by uh, geographic, et cetera. So this is another really, you know, rich way 
to look at different cultures within the United States and to see if you do happen to see some patterns that cross different you know, groups in, in the US. And again, understand that these are items that the Library of Congress collected. So while they try to be as inclusive as possible, you know, they they could well be missing some things as well. Um, the Taiwan one I, would be trickier, I think, if you just go if you type in Taiwan Photo Museum, you would probably be able to to get to that. Um, so. This is a really uh, fun thing from the Asian Art Museum, uh, how to read a woodblock print. And the reason I wanted to share this is uh, it points out the importance of the actual resource, the materials, and how they are handled artistically, visually. And then, um, and so they talk about, you know, the printmaking thing. So you're gonna see a lot about process in terms of visuals and culture and why they chose you know, uh, wood prints. And part of that has to do with dissemination of information as opposed to a painting, which is unique and only, you know, could be owned by one person and they're the only ones that see it. Or a painting might be in a public place that other people can see it, but only if they are there. Now we're digitizing this as a broader, but you know, historically, you know, how do you share information visually with a lot of people? So wood blocks then were one way to do that. So looking at the techniques, how they approach that medium is, is very culturally defined. And so this is a really good site for that. And then it will also then talk about then how do you interpret those images. In other words, you know, um, some of this is pretty realistic. Some of, of wood blocks are more kind of iconic. You know, so a, a collective understanding of what different images means and different elements within image mean and even colors, et cetera. So this goes into both the process as well as content and again, within a cultural understanding. So this is, uh, again, another really rich site. Um, for visual literacy. So now it's your turn. So here's kind of a, a current image. So um, what what do you see that that could hearken to different cultures or have a certain worldview? This is current. So French, and you know that because. Okay, joyeux, okay. What else? What other kind of maybe some cultural things that you see? Could be French Canadian, okay, and why? Okay, red and green colors remind me of Christmas, right? And then you've got Noel, okay, the French and more snow, all right? So France does have snow, I've been in France and snow, but yeah, uh, we think more Canada, more snowy than, than France, don't we? Yeah. Any other elements? Could there be a different, any other cultures that might be represented here? Gnomes, okay. So, you know, what culture are those, right? Gnomes and it's usually G-N-O and yes, right? So um, would you say this is more kind of iconic or than realistic or a little bit of stereotypes there? Got the snow going, iconic, okay. So those little white things are probably snow, huh? All right, so um, star, okay, and it, and so it's sort of like a gnome, but it could be it could obviously also be interpreted as a tree. Very good, okay. Could be the North Star, all right, all right. Or it could be a Christmas star, all right? Good. All right, so um, so a little bit of a uh, reveal. Um, this is my Christmas card from last year. And uh, so some history behind it. So those little characters are uh, what we call uh, Tompton, T-O-M-T-E-N, which, and the, that's the plural for Tompton. And those are Swedish 
uh, little kind of like gnomes and they're very traditional. And my background, um, all my, my you know, past relatives are from Sweden. And I visit Sweden ever so often, uh, most recently in 2018, just before COVID. And um, so these are little tomtom, which are, are like little teeny figures and they're like house elves, all right? And they can be somewhat mischievous, but they can also be trying, you know, give you good luck in the house. And so they are associated oftentimes with snow and they usually have like a beard kind of a thing. And um, again, they're having fun. I don't know if you, if you felt that sense of like, you know, does this look sad? Does this look happy? And so, um, Fishing is a big thing in Sweden, and also they have San Lucia Day, and they'll have like you know, um, you know, stars, and so very good about the Christmas tree. So yeah, the little gnome in the in the middle can be translated also as like a kind of Christmas tree kind of a thing. Um, so the gnome on the, on the left is on uh, candy canes. Candy canes are actually originated in southern Sweden, so I thought that would be kind of fun. And so where is the Joy Noel? Because in Sweden, it would be God Yule. And basically it was my son who, you know, we've also spent some time in France. Um, and he says like, I like, I prefer Joy Noel to God Yule. And I think more people would understand that, you know? And I said like, sure. <laughs> so uh, the composition in terms of it uses balance, there's some variety, there's some uh, unity. Um, again, you know, kind of the stereotypes of the pine trees. So that could be another reason why you thought Canadian is like, so those look like evergreen trees. That's what they're supposed to do. And uh, again, this is something that I drew. And again, the colors, absolutely. You know, the classic, you know, Christmas colors, which are colors in Sweden uh, for that, you know, as well. And then kind of the the rhythm of the using you know, the blue then is, is repeated in in the words as well. So you don't have to know anything about Sweden, obviously. Uh, you don't have to know anything about France because you can kind of figure out the Noel and G O Y Joy. So if you you don't know English, you're going to be in good shape. But this is kind of the. But I was kind of co-opting some um, you know cultural references, you know, for for the card. Yes, Aaron, that's exactly how you spell that um, for good yule. So um, with that, I also want you to know that uh, I've got lots of references, you know, here. And um, so some of you can, uh, you know, take notes by clicking on your camera. Again, this will be recorded. It's, uh, I really think that uh, visual literacy is kind of underrepresented and undervalued because people say, well, everybody can see. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people can see. So why do we need to teach this? But once you kind of understand some of the principles, you know, behind the visuals, different aspects to look at, and then layer that with the importance of cultural understanding, and again, cross-cultural understanding, then it's more important than ever. And again, being culturally sensitive when you send a message to other folks that you know um, they may have a different connotation for your use of colors or uses of images. So being aware of that um, helps to, um, you know, as you front load how you generate images is, is really important. And again, the more that librarians can, you know, share, um, you know, visual images from different cultures, have people looking at it, then I think the more um, appreciative we can be. So with that, we've got a couple minutes for questions or thoughts or comments. That was amazing, um, Dr. Farmer. I loved all of your sources and resources for everyone that's attending or listens to this. I think there's a lot of rich, um, well, content you provided, but opportunity here for all of us moving forward. Um, so I really appreciate it. And I don't have any questions. I just want to say a special thank you um, and for helping us kick off your voices. Absolutely. But if there's questions, please place them in the chat. Um, I'm going to put in, again, our blog if you want to check out your voices. And we do have our next webinar will be November 15th. Um, so please register for that if you're interested. And I'll give you that direct link as well. Super. Thank you so much, folks, for uh, being here, for participating. You know, 
Um, this is a great program. And um, I encourage you, what I tell my students at the end of each class is go forth and do good work. As uh, librarians really are, you know, facilitators for sharing knowledge, sharing information. And we empower people. Yes. Thank you again. I'm not seeing any questions. You're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat. Yeah, I appreciate that. So again, I, um, I'm a librarian. That's why you got lots of references and, and sources so that you can make it your own and share with others. Thank you again.